Good morning, you are listening to Blue Collar Tribe Podcast, and I'm your host, Splash, and I appreciate you listening to the podcast and sharing this with your friends. We've gotten a lot of Welcome new followers the last three weeks, seven of- so thank you for that. I have an amazing guest, but before I get to the guest, let's kind of get through the, the business of what keeps this podcast running. First and foremost, if you're a sprayer or you're in the market of buying a paint sprayer, make sure you reach out to your local D uh, retailer. And ask about the Graco battery operated by DeWalt FlexVolt battery system. It's an amazing, it's the system that I use on my paint sites. And it's the system that my employees have used for the last two years. We demoed this. So if you're in the market for a sprayer and you want to kind of up your game, get the FlexVolt DeWalt battery operated sprayer in the collaboration with Graco. All right, everyone. My guest today is Ovi. How are you doing today, Ovi? Awesome. Thanks awesome. for having me. Hey, it's a pleasure. I know we have a time difference. You're over in Israel and I'm over here in America. This is a fun conversation that I'm about to have with you. So listen, everyone, if you're in the trades, because obviously you listen to Blue Collar Tribe podcast, one of the things that we deal with is putting holes in walls or we're adding shelves to walls. But one of the biggest things that we come in that I see come into problems is, well, you put a hole in the wall and you miss the stud. Or you put a hole in the wall and you hit a water pipe or you hit an electrical box. Pray to God you didn't do that. But that could lead to further damage and more money out of your pocket. So, Ovi, who are you? Who do you work for? And, and why, are, why are we going to talk about what's behind a wall today? Hey, thanks for having me, first of all. This is awesome. Uh, love what you're doing. We're Wallabot, and we make a DIY tool that gives you the ability to look and see what's behind your walls. So imagine like a stud finder on steroids, okay? So you've got your classic stud finder where you're just moving it up against the wall and it either beeps or it doesn't beep. We actually give you an image of what's happening behind your wall. And I'll I'll describe how it works, but imagine that every time you go into one of those jobs, you have the ability before you drill, before you start hammering, to actually see what's behind your wall. So you see where is the stud, where are the pipes, where are the wires, and you can save yourself from exactly what you just described, Robbie, which is you don't want to be in a situation where you hit a pipe and you end up uh, you know, just in bad news. And I could tell you stories. Like when you work for a company like this, I could tell you stories of things people have done that are bonkers. Okay, we'll save a bonker story for a little bit later because I do want to get into that. And you are right. It's in, it's important to know what's behind a wall. Now, one thing is I've been in the trades for about 10 years now. Um, I've punctured many of holes. Those things that I've told you with the exclusion of hitting electrical wire, I've done. I've hit a water pipe. I've hit a gas pipe. Thankfully, nothing where it caused a severe amount of damage, but it happens. You're lucky, You're lucky man. You're lucky. Yeah. So real quick, Wallabot. You guys are new. I'll be honest with you. I found you guys on TikTok because that's what I do. I spend a lot of my days on TikTok looking for brand new companies. And I found you guys. And and I was very intrigued by it because I know that you guys are labeled as a DIY. But as a professional, I feel if you have the right tools in your toolbox, you are creating a better space for a more functional job site. You're creating... Uh, a time management because at the end of the day when you're blue collar time management is important because it allows you to one get a job done more efficient and two it saves you money and we're all about making money i don't care however you strap it down you're getting your ass up every morning because you want to work so let's give the audience if we can a little bit about where like how wallabot was created because i was told by one of the gentlemen I spoke with within your business. And I wanted to share that on the podcast because I found it very intriguing with the technology that you guys were first using with your parent company, which is who's they are. They are. So give us a little bit, if you can, a background on them. Yeah. So amazing origin story for Wallabot. Okay. So we're a company that makes semiconductors, like the least blue collar, the least cool thing you could ever imagine. Okay. We make chips. And what we do with those chips is they do 3d imaging with a radar. Okay. So what that means practically is 
if you want to see something with a lens or with a device, you need to have a camera, you need to have a picture. And that requires light and line of sight. Okay. And what the geniuses behind VR did, and I'm not one of them, but like literally geniuses is they took that same concept of a radar, which everyone's familiar with from tracking how fast the car is going, like a cop using a radar from, you know, a jug's gun from a baseball stadium, seeing how fast the baseball goes. It's the same concept, but instead of just giving you how fast something's moving and where it is, we collect enough data in a very small space to be able to create a super cool image of that object. So now imagine why does it work for going inside of walls? So we start to look, well, what's the reason to create this chip? So we actually started, if you can imagine, <clears throat> We started our company to build medical devices that can look inside of the body and be able to create 3D images of cancerous growths inside of a breast. Okay. So it's as high technology as you could get. And the idea was a radar has waves and those waves are able to penetrate through objects and they're able to see enough to be able to tell you something's there. And what's the magic of our technology? It's not just that there's something there, but we can actually create a 3D image of that thing that's there. And so we started with this one application for medical devices and we were like, what else can we do where you need to look inside of something and create an image? And we had this group of, of people here in Israel who were like, what can we use this world beater technology for? And somebody was like, hey, I do a bunch of DIY projects. I hang up, you know, whether it's hanging as simple as hanging up a picture in my home or real pro projects, like real professional projects that you would need, you know, a contractor, or, you know, at the very least a handyman to handle. Right. And they were like, this would be really great if I could look inside of the wall and just figure out where the stud is, where the pipes are, where the wires are. And not just one of those little beepers, right? Something that actually gives you an image. So we started to build concepts around that and we started to say, okay, same exact thing we're doing with medical devices to look inside of the skin, to penetrate through the skin, to create 3D images of cancer. So we can use the same technology for something that's way downstream, like way more applicable to the common, to the common man, the common lady, and create a tool that somebody can just use to look inside of his or her wall and know what the heck is on the other side. Um, so that's kind of the origin story. I'll get, there's so much, there's so many more layers to it, but that was like, the origin was this thing can see inside of things. It's, we used to call it at that time, Superman vision. What would be a cool way to use that? And we just started building and we were like, Hey, all of us like to do DIY projects. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had one of these? I like it. I like the wall about name and we'll get to that, but you should have just kept it as Superman vision for, dry, for, for wall, for wall searching. <clears throat> um, I've demoed your tool. I've actually been demoing your tool for about three weeks now. I like it. It's very handy. Thank it, you. Um, it, it's a lot better than the beep in, in the aspect of I know exactly where I'm going to be putting a wall in. Now, one thing you said, hanging pictures. I don't know how it is across the world, but in videos I see on social media, I'm seeing a lot of people put a shelf up that's like three feet or four feet long. And they'll hang like four pictures on, they'll put, not hang, they'll set the pictures on the shelf. So instead of actually traditionally hanging it on the wall, they're putting a shelf. <clears throat> and one of the things I've noticed with that is these aren't just like your eight by tens. These are like 40 by 45s. They're massive. And it started making me think like, okay, that's a lot of weight going on the wall. And I'm sure all of us at some point have hung something on the wall and it fell down. I think it's just Whoa. one of those like oh, passages Lord. of life, right? <laughs> your wife, wife your, first spouse, home, you know? your first home, your first broken toe. It's yeah. it happened to everyone. And if you're lucky enough, you've had something hang on the wall and it falls right off and hits you in the head. But Wallabot <laughs> is going to take that away because what I have found is um, <clears throat> what we can see behind the wall. And before we get into that, I do have a question. And I ask this to all tool creators that I have on the podcast. How many runs, if you if you know, how many demo products did it take to get to this final? Because you guys have, what, four versions now, I think? Yeah, and I'll, I, will, I will even stop you in the middle of the question. We're, there, when we think as a technology company, so our perspective is there's no such thing as a final version, right? We have products that sell 
and they're great versions, but our sensor, it's a sensor at its core, right? Mm -hmm. It has two elements to it. Number one, it has the hardware. So somebody buys it and they have hardware. But what's amazing about it is that there's a software side of it too. So what that means is you take the, you know, this, this tool that sits on your cell phone, okay? Whether it's iPhone, Android, it connects to your phone. And then the imaging that you see doesn't come on our tool. It comes on your screen. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that I have another way to always be improving my product on the software side. And I have another way in which if I want to add more <clears throat> tools, if I want to include new features, if I want to change something. So I can do all of that over the air. So on the one hand, we've got hardware and I can tell you how many times it took us, how many runs it got till we got something sellable, right? Until we got something sellable. Wow. It took us a long time because it was also our first ever consumer product. Um, oh, wow. So it wasn't just our first ever tool. It was our first consumer product. We're not in the U.S. market. We're, we're in Yehud in Israel, which is really close to the airport for those who have been here. We want everybody to come visit us. Israel's amazing. But it's not like a tools hotbed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not surrounded by people who are super interested in this type of thing. It's a high tech zone. So there's a lot of different there there was a lot of learning that went into it, and we're continuously learning. There's no such thing as a final version. There's a version that's selling right now. It's awesome. We stand behind it. But the version that somebody buys now can still get better on the software side. Um, and we'll keep improving. You know, we've had three or four different runs over the, since we released the three or four different runs of hardware where we improved the hardware. We're in a pretty good spot with the hardware now. So I don't think that'll have major changes in the near future. But when it comes to software and features, we're also open from, you know, from your listeners, Robbie, any, any of your listeners who have a great idea, just let us know, you know, we're, we're, we're all about that interaction, the feedback, making things better. And that's, that's good for a company. That's great for us as consumers to hear from a company say, Hey, we're going to be, we're going to listen. It, it's that thing of like, even though there's a toaster made or someone figured out how to slice a, a bread, you know, one sixteenth of an inch, some of us like thicker Texas style bread, you know, it's, it's always good to know that there's a change out there. How did the name Wallabot come? Were you part of that? I'm always curious how someone comes up with the name. Okay. So we had a, we had a guy here who is not with us anymore. I mean, he's with us, but not at Bayar anymore. Malcolm Berman who was the mastermind behind the Wallabot brand. And there was kind of three things that went into it, right? There's obviously wall. You're seeing inside of a wall. Mm -hmm. And bot kind of had two different elements to it, right? So there was, well, four things, right? There's, there's the wall piece of it. There's the bot, which was like at the time, this was like maybe four or five years ago when we started thinking about this, maybe even six already. And like chat bots were a big craze. So we were like, it's like it talks to you and tells you what's on the other side of the wall. But much more prominently, it was like, it's not a robot, it's a wall bot. So it was like kind of like wall robot. And then also in Hebrew, when something's really cool, you say voila, you know, like voila. So it like had all those elements where it was like kind of like the voila, wall, robot, bot. And we just kind of put it all together and we were like, hey, Wallabot. And it just kind of stuck. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like it. I, that's extremely interesting. I would have never, ever. I mean, I got the wall part, but the bot, I was like, eh, it didn't make sense. But it, it's a, a, a beautiful way of, of uh, coming up with a name. Now, I, I yeah. will say this. Yeah. I know that in your guys' and your website, it does say DIY. Listen, I know the blue collar people, we kind of have this chip on our shoulder. Guys, I'm telling you right now, as a blue collar tradesman, person, human, whatever you want to relate to me as, I know the DIY is in there. This tool is for the professionals. Don't be confused by that DIY. It's it's very important because, again, <clears throat> a DIYer in this instance, from my perspective, and I'll just give you what my perspective is when I hear this, when I got your tool and saw your videos, husbands, spouses across the world, wives across the world are always hanging pictures. The last thing they want to do is add more damage to the wall. And that's great if they do, because if they don't want to fix, they call a painter or a contractor, they get a fix. But ultimately, this tool is to help you find what's behind the wall. Now, let's go into the trades world. It is valuable. Like, it's invaluable to know what's behind a wall. Because you can be hanging stuff for people. You're adding on new additions. I even, and I didn't tell Rami this, is the content that I had there. I was actually reading my floor 
I had some carpet that I had to lift up and I was reading the studs because I wanted to know like, okay, if like hypothetically, I want to put a ceiling light, what actually happened is I have an attic space. I'm putting a wall, uh, a ceiling, I'm, I'm moving, I'm moving one of my lights in my garage shop and I read the wall and it exactly, I marked it, crawled up into my attic space and was like, God damn, this is exactly the spot that I was looking for. But Again, I don't know if a traditional stud finder is going to tell me that with all the, the, um, uh, oh my gosh, the, I can't even think of what right now, but all the junk in my, in, that's in our attic, not like boxes, but there's, there's a bunch of other stuff that's up. There's a lot more thicker wood and whatnot. So I was very impressed with it reading, not just a wall. I could read ceilings. I could read my floor. So if I needed to add something or just check to see if there's a pipe there, and that's where it became valuable to me is like if you're doing a 1950 home and you don't know where the water lines are or the electrical wire underneath the house is, And I just gave away my next topic with you. Mm -hmm. It read all that because there's like a and I could be wrong, but there's like a thermal reading or a radar. I'm not exactly. Okay, it's how not, It's not a thermal that. reading. I can, I can tell you how it works. Maybe it's okay. a good time to talk about how the system actually works. OK, I love it. So Let's get into it. There's no heat. There's no light. OK, so I don't know. If any of the tradesmen or women on podcast right now are, are, are radars people, but I love talking about radars. So when I moved, I moved to Israel, I joined Vayar when there was maybe 20, 25 people here. I knew nothing about radars and it was, I wouldn't call it love at first sight, but you know, my primary objective has been to understand how our technology works. Right. And, and the path that that's led me down is one in which I love like I love talking about radars. So it's a, it usually is a conversation killer, but I'm going to try to make it as cool as it's possible. It's not a killer here because we want to know. I mean, it's a valuable part of our business. So, so here's how it works. What's in a wall? So here's how it works, okay? Every time, you know, if you think about a radar, you're thinking about like air traffic control, sending out a super, super, super heavy, powerful wave really far away to figure out where an airplane is in the sky, right? So think like Vietnam, the green, lime green screen with the circle going around, and you can pick out where the airplane is moving. So how does that actually work? There is this super powerful antenna, and it sends a really strong wave really far away, and it finds something in the air that is really reflective. And what I mean by reflective is there's something called a dielectric constant, okay? Every object on Earth has what's called a dielectric constant. For We're not going to get into what that means, but basically it means how strong the bounce back of the wave that hits it is going to be, okay? So when you send that super powerful wave out into the sky, it hits something that has a really, really powerful bounce back effect, a really powerful reflection. And that's this big metal box that's flying across the sky, okay? So there are two things that have really, really, really powerful and high dielectric constants, and those are metals and liquids, okay? So for example, a person is primarily made out of liquid. So if I use my sensor, and you can do this with the Wallabot in excerpt mode, and I put my hand up against it, you'll be able to get a rough outline of the fingers on my hand, okay? Why? Because what's happening is lots of little tiny waves are bouncing off my hand and bouncing back. So inside of the Wallabot, there's the chip that gives a command to the antennas to both transmit waves and receive waves that bounce off of objects. So what happens is when you look inside of a wall, so there's a wall and the device has inside of it this micro radar, it transmits waves inside of the wall and they hit something with a strong dielectric constant, either a metal pipe, a wire that has some metal going through it, um, could be water, could be uh, you know like a piece of PVC that has some type of liquid inside of it, could even be a wooden stud could be nails, but that will give a strong reflection that then will be received by those receiving antennas. And that's where the algorithms come in, that then whatever information comes back to that sensor, inside of the device, we're interpreting that information. And based on machine learning, we're saying those waves that bounce back, those are wooden studs, those are metal studs, those are pipes. Okay, so let me give one more example to make it a little more easy for you, okay? like easy for anyone, okay? So we talked about the airplane that's high up in the sky, okay? Same idea, let's say you're trying to see how fast the baseball is moving. So you've got a jugs gun and you send one wave, the wave bounces off that baseball and another wave, like it bounces off and then comes back, okay? So the jugs gun has both a transmitting antenna and the receiving antenna. 
Okay, and how do I know how fast it's going? So that's based on the time displacement of that wave. It takes okay. a certain amount of time for the wave to hit the target and then come back. And now based on that time displacement, I'm able to tell you relative to the sensor where that target is and how fast it's moving. Okay, and mm -hmm. it's the same exact thing when we look inside of a wall. We send waves inside of the wall. They reflect right back out to the sensor and then we interpret them and say, oh, that's a wooden stud, that's a metal stud, that's a hand, that's a cricket, that's a termite, that's a rat, that's a dead body. I could tell you questions we've had asked. One guy called us up once. He's like, can you guys see ghosts? And we were like, whoa, above my pay grade? <laughs> but yeah, if there's ghosts in your wall, for sure we're going to see them. And then somebody was like, well, you know, we just responded to them. Well, do they have a soul or not? You know, <laughs> that type of thing. But it's, it's real, real questions we've gotten because everything, every object on Earth has a dielectric constant and has some type of reflection. The wall has a very thin, it's a very thin layer, has a low dielectric constant, so we can penetrate through it in both the in and the out direction and still be able to get the information of what's happening inside of it. I like it. I, I do want to de dive deeper into the wall, <clears throat> like what's in the wall, because I did some demos and what we've talked about. But first, let's hear from our sponsor. And before I get to our sponsor, I just want to say thank you to Jacob for watching us on the YouTube. I appreciate it. We'll be back from our sponsor in 30 seconds. Attention Tribers. Plant Powered Marketing is your cutting edge marketing agency specializing in SEO, Google My Business, website development, and many other strategies that get you ranked number one on Google. We're your go-to marketing agency for businesses who want to see real, tangible results from their online presence. Our team of experts has years of experience in getting businesses to the top of Google and generating leads through effective online marketing campaigns. Remember to let us build your next website. Contact us if you want to outrank the competition. Plant Powered Marketing, 971-570-0511 or plantpoweredmarketing at gmail.com. All right. Thank you. Reach out to my friend Spencer and he will help you build your business on Google because it's one thing as a tradesman you need to know. If you're not hitting the market strong, your competition is going to beat you. All right. Ovi, you said something interesting. A lot of things interesting, but um, in relation to what blue collar people are going to look at, because um, I do, I'm with you. I could sit and learn about radars and, and talk about the technology side of it. It's important. But what I want to get down to is the nails of it. Why, in a basic term, why can your stud finder technology read wood? Okay. So again, it just gets back to exactly what we described, which is every single object has this magic number, this dielectric constant. And when a wave hits it and another wave bounce back, bounces back. So based on that waves or that series of waves or that collection of waves that bounce back, we are able to interpret what it is behind the wall. And so if you know a little bit about machine learning, right? So the way it works is you get lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of data points, okay? To, to really bring it down to simple terms that a guy like me can understand. We get lots and lots and lots of data points. We understand patterns. And then we say, based on those patterns, I'm able to predict with very high confidence that what's happening now is the same thing as what I saw over the last 100,000, 200,000, 20 million data points. So we see what wood looks like from a radar signature perspective, and then we're able to reinterpret that, and boom, that's exactly what, what it is. It's wood. And the technology you have. So the Wallabot that I have, um, I can't exactly remember what model. Let me see if it'll tell me on here. Uh, the Wallabot DIY2 is the one I've been using. There's two settings on it. There's one that basically and and we will show i know this is an audio podcast i will have some videos ovi and i are going to do some demonstrations i've already done some demonstrations i've not yet loaded on the website um on my tiktok and instagram so those are coming but you have two and i'm going to re i'm going to say the words wrong but if you help me on this you have two settings one is like a blank canvas wall that's white when i scan over the wall i see a, a wood you can tell it's a two by four you know that it's two by four but then as you're moving you'll see like a blue curve which was an electrical lines that i saw or yeah you see but then you have the secondary vision that you can look at what is the difference if you can on those two because i don't remember the verbiage you guys used but it was like 
it, it was more high def, I guess would be my relation to it. It was more high def picture of, as you said, reading the sensors. I want to say it's heat or moisture, but the technology is there. But what is that that you guys created with that? Sure. So there's there's two there's two modes of the sensor, okay, of the of the tool. One of them is what's called images mode, which is what you're describing, where it it just shows you what you want to see, which is wood, wire and pipe, metal. And it also tells you the center of the stud too. So it's not just telling you here's the wooden stud, but it actually can pinpoint within a few centimeters of accuracy, this is the stud center, which is also super helpful, especially for professionals, because when you're doing a job as a pro, you got to really get it right. It's not just about making sure the picture stays up on the wall, right? Yeah. So the second mode is what we call expert mode, okay? And what that does is it actually gives you an image of what's behind the wall without doing that layer of interpretation. So for example, when you're in images mode, it tells you wood, pipe, and wire, stud, okay? Or, or metal. But when you're in expert mode, all it's doing is showing you that reflection, okay? So it kind of looks like reddish, bluish, but it's showing you what there is behind the wall. So I'll tell you, a lot of our pros actually only use expert mode because you don't really care if it's the wood or if it's a pipe, if it's a pipe or a wire. But if you got something complex that's happening behind the wall, you're less interested in what it is. You're more interested in understanding what's happening behind that wall. This is an area to avoid. This is an area I should go with. So, so yeah, it's it's just it's just the radar image. It's just a two D two D radar image that's created in real time that's showing up on the screen. And I'll show we I've already recorded some videos and they it was it was very interesting to see. I went out with a friend of mine who's a home inspector, and I don't know. I've I've saved this question specifically to ask you live because I don't know. I couldn't find any research on it. But does your do any of these uh, Wallabots read mold? Because as the okay. home inspector, he's like, hey, so, if it does, perfect, that'd be cool. I'm like, perfect I have no question, idea. Okay? So so let, let's go one step back, okay? <clears throat> when do most people use the expert mode that I described? So let's say you've got something that's behind your wall that's not a pipe, a wire, or a stud. Let's say you got a rat living behind your wall, okay? God forbid. But you got a rat that's living behind your wall. So the rat has this strong radar reflection. So when I take the wall bot and I move it over where that rat is, you're going to see that there's something big, fat living behind that wall. Yeah. Now, it's not just a matter of I don't want to drill there, but it's a matter of, okay, I see there's something there. I know that that's something that either I have to get rid of or I have to avoid. But what you'll see in the images mode is it'll say object detected, right? And yeah. then you switch to that expert mode, and then you start to get a little bit of a picture of that. So what's mold, okay? Number one, I want to just be clear. We do not advertise that we can do mold detection. We do not advertise that we can do either termites or crickets. But let me tell you how you could actually use our tool to do those things if you're comfortable working in the expert mode, okay? So, so mold is something that's going to have a much higher level of moisture than a regular drywall, okay? Drywall is called a drywall. It's dry. But yeah. once you get mold on a wall, so what happens is that's something that's eating at the wall, and it's eating at it with moisture, OK, so if you're using expert mode, no doubt you will see a subtle difference between a drywall with nothing behind it versus a drywall that's got mold building up behind it. OK, now, again, I'm not saying that's a feature that we publicize. I'm not saying that's something that, you know, when I sell this in a retail context, it doesn't say can detect mold. But if you're a tradesman, if you're somebody who understands how to use the tool, you can use it as a first step to say, for sure there's something funky going on here. And whether it's an animal living behind the wall, whether it's, you know, we, we've heard so many crazy stories, but people put all types of, you know, what behind their wall, okay? There is stuff people put behind walls that even some of the most experienced craftsmen would not believe that we've seen, we've heard about, we've got videos of. So, you know, so some of that is is where the expert mode comes in and the, the, the mold question fits exactly into that. We don't advertise we can detect mold, but can you use the device? And if you know there's mold, will you see a difference? Yes. So can it use as something predictive? You know, I bet the answer is yes. So I'll go with if you're knowledgeable enough to know that there's something behind the wall. Like, I mean, home inspectors across the world, they're pretty good at what they do. There's a reason why they do what they do. And and knowing that there's moisture there, you should be able to tell. And um, he's he's actually uh, I'm I'm gonna go to another house with him and and do some detection with it because he's like I know there's a house that he cut out mold already, 
but there's another section it's like, hey, let's bring it over to see because he's like, hey, this is going to help me just in basic of what he was doing. But it's like, you know, it, it, which le- he said, if he does it right, he feels he could find it, which leads me to something with your um, with your product that I want to talk about, because in the trades we talked earlier, time is money. Money is time. If you're not doing things fast, you're not doing things efficient. And then you can lose time, which is money. But one thing about your tool that was interesting and it was a little hiccup for me at first, but I understood why. And I want to exp- why I'm, I'm having this conversation. If you buy this product, you need to understand one thing. Every wall is different. When you get your wall, when you get your wall about, you have to, um, and technically tell me what the word is, but you have to regulate it. So you turn it on and you have to do a demo on the wall first. You're, you're doing circles, wax on, wax off, yeah. if you can picture that. You're, we call, you're doing we call it that. calibration. So yes, you're, I'm, you have to calibrate it. Well, what I did is I was in one room, which is my studio, because I did the open box here. And then I went to another room across the room, and it wasn't reading. And I was like, what the hell? So I calibrated again. Took 30 seconds. That wall that I actually calibrated, I actually had like a two by four foot piece cut out of the drywall unfortunately I had a flood. So I knew where my wall was and I wanted to read it on both settings. And it showed me after I calibrated it. So one thing that, um, you know, I, I had shown, I've shown three other tradesmen this tool and we had talked about it. Cause for me, when I demo tools, I don't want just my perspective of it. I also want to hear other professionals, what they, you know, I trust their opinion. That's why I work with sure. them. Um, they just don't show their faces anywhere. Cause they're like, I, they're too handsome. Like, dude, I'll break the camera. But, <laughs> Luck, but the luckily, comment, I don't have that problem. Yeah, you and I were like, hey, we're just here. You know, someone Cheer. may buy us a drink, but who knows? Who knows? You take what you can get at this stage of life. Yeah, <laughs> when you're 40, you don't know. But the conversation that we were having was, why do we have to recalibrate it? And I said to them, I said, listen, it's the age old saying, and, and any true craftsman will know this measure twice, cut once. With the wall bot, if you're going to change walls, recalibrate it. And know exactly what's behind the wall. Because I can tell you from my own demos, if you don't recalibrate it, you could potentially not get where everything's at. Because one wall, as we've said, is different than another wall. You may have had a guy that puts every wall 16 on center. But then the next guy that did the other room could be 18 on center. In in the term of where your studs are. So I do like that about the tool. Have you guys in, you've demoed and I want to, why I'm asking, you know, bring this up is you told me earlier that you went out across the world and we're getting different samples of walls. Give us a little bit more because I love that you guys as a company said, Hey, we're just not going to take drywall. There's plaster walls. You probably know more about walls than I do. I'm going to start with, I think we hit a point where we know more about walls, especially U.S. walls. I don't want to say walls globally because they got some crazy stuff going on in places like India, in China, you know, in the Far East, so much of it is just it's just cement, right? But in places like India, there are walls that have mud and there, there's crazy stuff going on all around the world. But in America, I'm just going to give you two words, okay? Horsehair, okay? So we start going through these walls. Right, you're looking at me like I'm crazy. Horsehair. Okay, this is a true story, okay? True story. So we start off with a, with a version for drywall. How do we know what drywall looks and feels like in America? So there's different types of drywall. There's double drywall. There's old drywall. There's new drywall. We start to, you got to knock on it. You hear different, you hear, you hear a different knock. Drywall in Europe is different than drywall in America. Okay. It, it, it's yeah. thicker in Europe. Okay. Why? Because it's colder there. Who the hell knows why? But drywall is different no matter where you go. So we start to cut out pieces of drywall and start mailing them back to our technical team in Israel. So I was going to construction sites where, you know, or, I mean, on the other end of the spectrum, I went to a bunch of houses that had, that had been in fires, right? So a house has bad fire damage. A lot of times you're going to do a full, you know, full refurb, really basically not knock down the house, but you're basically going to going to take huge parts of the house. So there's lots of wall there. So I would go to these like fire sites and I would mm-hmm. show up with, a giant knife, you know, like, like it, like it, one of these, like in, it wasn't even a saw. It was like one of these industrial knives. And I would literally cut out boxes of wall. And then I would find a way to mail these boxes, you know, like a box of wall across the world. Okay. So we start getting the same question every time. Do you guys do lath and plaster? Now we're a bunch of 
cracks in Israel. I'm like one of the, you know, Rami and I are two of the only guys here who were speaking English at the time. Rami wasn't even here yet. Okay. So we're like talking, we're like, we have a meeting, like, does anyone here know what lath and plaster is? And all these Israeli guys are like, no, you know, we're like, <laughs> we're like, can somebody please do a search of lath and plaster and does this work? So we start looking and we start understanding like lathing. So I have, I have a friend, one of my, one of my really best friends is, you know, a little bit of a carpenter, but he's, he, he does basically like not windows, but he, he does, um, how do you say it? Uh, drapes. He's drapery. Okay. Contour drapery folks. If you're in the New York area, big plug. Okay. Mark Kalis. So he does drapes. So I start calling him up. I'm like, Mark, I don't know anything about walls. Take me to sites. So he starts taking me around with him in sites and he's taking me to places in Manhattan. And I have another friend who flips out boilers. Who's like, you know, real hardcore blue collar work, flipping out boilers, improving people's heat all around Manhattan. And he's also taking me to sites and everywhere I go, it's the same as, can I take a little bit of your wall? Which is a strange thing to ask someone. Uh, but, but you know, we started building this collection. And in the Northeast pre-war homes in the Northeast United States, many of them have this wall type, which is called lath and plaster. So the, the lathing is like, basically, it's like wooden strips, okay? It's like wooden strips. And then there's plaster that connects those wooden strips. So it's these wooden strips and then a big, thick, uh, stud that goes like diagonal across those strips to give it form. And then there's plaster that basically sucks all of that in and makes it into a wall. And then you paint over it. Okay. Now what's going to blow your mind right now. So these walls that are made of lath and plaster, every type of plaster is different. There's no standard for plaster. So people in like the twenties, the forties, the 30, you know, people in, in the early 1900s, they're putting whatever the hell they can get into this plaster to make it stronger. So we start testing these walls and it's a pretty sensitive sensor and everyone is coming up different. Like every single wall, we're like, what the hell's going on here? So we start, we start pulling them apart and we're pulling apart these walls with lath and plaster and we keep seeing hairs in the plaster and we're like, what the hell? There's hair in this thing. And, and, you know, we're, we're pulling all types of crap out of there, but we keep, just keep seeing hairs. So we start doing research and it was like one of the most common ways in which people made this plaster was to put horse hair inside of the plaster as like a sticking agent. So we've got these walls in our, weird. not just weird, crazy. So like I can take you when you come to Israel, all you guys are invited. Anyone listening to the podcast is invited. You come to Israel, come to our office. I will show you walls, pre-war walls that we pulled out of houses in Boston and Chicago all around either the, the upper Midwest or the, you know, the Northeast in the U S that have this thick plaster and you can literally pull the hairs out yourself. So we got to a point and I think we're still there where we know more about walls than like anybody. Like we know so much about what is inside of a wall in a, you know, in a U.S. home. It's crazy how much you learn. And interesting. I would imagine the horsehair had like some type of bonding binding not bonding binding complex to it but the great thing about you guys doing that and traveling across the u.s which sounds like a job i would love to do it is, is it's awesome is you cared about the products you were making for the consumer we don't see i mean we do see it now but there's so many knockoffs i mean a stud finder's a stud finder i mean there's a guy that did a video on tiktok he had like four million views about a stud finder and he it was like him Re doing a reflection of himself with a mirror which is kind of funny but it was you know seeing all these other people use other stud finders like i have five different stud finders you know um and i've tested them i have not released the video because you know i want to wait before i wanted to have you guys on and it was interesting to see how pinpoint your product was comparable to other we won't name brands that are out there on the market that have been out for years and so what it shows me is you guys, one, have cared about the technology, which is the first important thing. Second, you said, okay, we understand that there's not the same kind of wall built. The weirdest thing I've ever seen in a wall I've demoed was hay. I've seen a lot of hay. I'm in Utah. And in Utah, Nevada, I've seen hay. Mm -hmm. um, I've also heard of wire mesh in walls, like uh, Dolby, um, my, sure. it, the house I grew up in, one of the homes that we I lived in, grew up in, was an Adobe type home. There was a mess, like I want to say chicken wire, you know, but the fact that you traveled and said, hey, we know that there's no there's there's 
gypsum is not the only type of drywall. You've, you've taken that next step, I think above anybody that I've heard and read about and said, hey, let's go and tear down a wall or take sections of it and let's really put it to a test, you know, which is a testament to Wallabot. Um, I know that you're pressed for time. We're going to do some videos. Where can people, wallabot.com? Is where you yeah, guys are at? Wall, wallabot, wall, wallabot.com backslash DIY. Sorry about the DIY backslash <laughs> for the treatment. No, but that's, no. Uh, that's... But you know what, though? It, it, in the scheme of blue collar workers, the DIY is, it's just a three letter word. At the end of the day, we're going to buy the tools. I mean, I know DIYers that have better shops, like better craftsman shops than I do. But I also know DIYers that buy low level sprayers that are calling me like, hey, dude, I need to borrow your professional spray. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'll, you know, I'll come do it for you. But at the end of the day, the DIY to me, craftsmen are the one putting things on the wall. But how many husbands and wives are hanging things on the wall all year long, all month long? Johnny, you take your family on a cruise. You get a picture of Johnny laying on the piano. And you're like, it's the best picture ever. Let's get a 50 by 50 to hang on the wall. You want yeah, to make sure it's... you're finding the stud in the center to do what, to do what you need to do. Totally. Obi, I can sit and have hours of conversation. I really do think we're going to have to go round two with this. If, if, if someone's in Vegas, I will be at the trade show. Huge announcement. Da -da. Not a huge, but I will be at the Vegas trade show at the end of the month. I have heard rumors that you guys may be there. If so, we'll have to do a part two of this um, and, and have a drywall there that we can use because it, it's fascinating to me. But listen, tradesmen and women, if you are one of those people that are reading drywall and you have to, you're, that's just your business. It could even be you carpenters that are hanging up design walls. There's a lot of guys I follow on, on Instagram and TikTok that are doing design walls. It's important for you to find a good base structure to know where to center your wall. This is your tool. So visit Wallabot. I have a discount code. I'll put it in the comments once we post this section. You're going to discount using my, my discount. Ovi, is there anything else you want to let anyone know before we run out? Because I know we're going to do a video and you'll be able to see the, the I, I keep wanting to say thermal. I, I'm so sorry. It's a radar, but it's the it's 1980 good. Good. movies that shows thermal. I think the Predator. That's exactly where I'm getting it from. Is the Terminator Predator because it looks almost like that. You're seeing that yeah. yellow, blue, and red. For sure, the imaging looks a lot the same. And I would just say thank you. You know, we appreciate the opportunity to be on your show, and any feedback that you know, we, we take the feedback seriously. So if you guys say to us, "Make this better," "Add this feature," you know, it doesn't mean we do 100% of what our our users ask us to do. We're still running a business, but if yeah. there's something that will make the experience better for you as a tradesman, as a pro, send us that feedback. Rami reads it for real. It's real people behind it. It's not just nameless, faceless tools. Yeah. So we'd love to engage and we appreciate the engagement from your side too. Yeah, Rami's a good guy. I did tell Rami one thing because before we go, I want to talk about this because you just clicked something that reminded me. One thing I found interesting with your product is um, – I am the nerd that reads the pamphlets. I just want everyone to know this. If I get sent a tool, I will read the pamphlet. I do. I I, I find it valuable. Your pamphlet said to use the cord that came with the product. So I asked Remy, I said, hey, why do I have to use your cord? You know, and like to charge it because it's a chargeable unit. Um, and he told me and I said, listen, that's great. I have six cords that are the same length, but you need to give me a color because the, the technology behind that, if you can touch on that, if from my understanding is, is that because we're dealing with a radar and, and a chip, it, it's sensitive to certain things. So you could, if you're using like, a, let's say a cell phone charger, you could overcharge it. And, and the way I vision it, and this sounds silly to say, but it's the truth of the way my mind works, is like I could overstimulate the radar and the chip inside the unit. You're right. So first of all, I, I wouldn't, those are pretty extreme scenarios. I don't think we've had too many people call us up and say, I baked my, I baked my wall about <laughs> using my cell phone charger. Um, but I agree with you. It's good feedback to make it a little bit more clear, which cord to use. It's more on the safety side though. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too concerned about charging it with a cell phone charger. My guess is Rami would know better. We can ask him, but I bet you a lot of our users just, charge it with their cell phone charger and it yeah. works though. But no, it was, it, it, it pinpointed back to you saying that you listen to feedback. 
Um, you know, and Rami was very, you know, kudos to him because when we talked about it, I said, Hey, this is one thing that concerned me because if there's a reason why, again, make your product, your product stand out. And it was just, it's a dumb thing. Cause it's a cord color. Rami is, but... a, real one, Rami is a real one. He he takes, takes his stuff serious. And Zev, the guy who runs the group, you know, the, on the product side, they're real. They take this stuff seriously. So. Yeah. And what stores, if you can, if you know, off the top of your head before you run, what stores in the U.S. market are you on? I know we're you're not, on Amazon. We're, not, we're, not, we're, not, we're on Amazon, but most of our sales are online. We'd love if there's any retailers there who want to put Wallabot in their stores. We're happy to talk, but we haven't really focused as much cause, just because we sell so much better online. The yeah. online sales these days, the you know, people just love it. So we sold successfully. We're happy to talk to any retailer, but the, the overwhelming majority of our sales have been online. Both I'm gonna, from our website and Amazon. I'm going to chime in on that. Listen. I have said this before, and we, you and I have never talked about this. If you're selling a product, I know and this is nothing against store shelves, like Home Depot, Lowe's. I was there yesterday. There's 4 billion people that shop online every day. Your marketplace today in 2023 is online. You need to make sure you have a great website and that you have the marketing behind you to do it, which you guys do. But if you're building a product, because this, this podcast Blue Collar Tribe is created for you guys that are tool creators and for the people that are going to use the tools. If you're hanging your hat that you want to be on a store shelf, you're missing out on billions of people every day with the ability to see your tool. So if you have questions on the marketing, come talk to me. That's what Splash Comedia is about. That's why I'm here running this podcast. I know I just kind of went totally serious on you, but Ovi, it, you're 1000% correct because stores are great. We like to go touch things. I mean, hell, I can go buy a Toyota Tacoma today through a vending machine called Carvana and never sit in it. But For in real. 1990, yeah. I had to go drive to 20 different, you know, parking lots just to find the dang truck that I wanted to get. For sure. For hey, sure. Toyota, I'm in the market for a truck, Toyota. So you can send me one. I'll demo it out. I'll show you how blue collar people really rough up a truck. <laughs> All right, Ovi. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Much love. Let's get the uh, intro music on here. I know you got to run. So thank you so much. And we will catch you next week, everybody. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.